Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. <clears throat> so it's very exciting. Today we're, <clears throat> we're, we're moving into day three. And I've said it before, and I'll probably keep saying it. As these days progress, they become more and more subtle. The work itself becomes more subtle. And it's easy for us to miss it. To miss, not, I mean, if you're following the Lord and you're led by the Lord, you may be doing it intuitively. But you might miss it from a cognitive sense that you're actually going through these processes. So we want to be aware of that. To help us in that endeavour, I grabbed a passage from Divine Providence that I'm going to read first. A few little snippets from it. It's paragraph 220, where Swedenborg talks about God being infinite and eternal, and yet somehow God in his infinite and eternal nature is able to be a part of our temporal reality as well. Before I do that, let's ask a question. We've looked at day one, light, light breaking into our consciousness, some new revelation. Then day two, who remembers day two? Separation. Anyone else other than Ian remember? <laughs> separation, Did we, can we, we describe the separation? Observing from a distance. Observing, beautiful. Observing, observation. That's probably the key word, observing in a non-judgmental way. Because something's happened to us as we've come into the space between. That quantum space we've come into, something's happened to us. What's happened to the ego? What's happened to the ego in that moment? Well, if the waters below on earth represent the voice and the emotions of our ego and we've risen up out of it, what's happened to the ego there? Silent. Silent. Yeah. Absolutely silent. And incredibly, the waters above, which are the voices of the angels in heaven, they're also not imposing on us. How beautiful. Mm. <coughs> they're waiting. They're waiting for day three, where that water can now come down and find a new home called New Earth. But what's happening to our ego? When we think about this, this is not a... a what am I, the word I'm looking for? This is not an insignificant event. To actually separate from our ego is not insignificant. It's quite a profound event. What would you compare it to, Russell? A word, what's another external thing that happens to people that you could compare separating the ego from? Yeah, I, I just see it really as just um, <clears throat> going into a space where you forget everything that you've been in this world. So wh when does that happen to everyone? Sorry, what was that? When does that happen to everyone? When does it happen to everyone? When is it unstoppable? When is it unavoidable? Can't, sorry, sorry. Sleep. Sleep, that's pretty good. That's sleep, I think that's very, very... Definitely the angels are able to interact with us through our dreams a lot better in our sleep. The, when your body dies. Oh, bingo! Bingo! Death of the body causes an unstoppable separation of the ego. But the beauty here of being in Christ is that we can die now and come alive in him in a new way we can actually begin the process now which is beautiful what exactly are we dying to self the ego it's important now let us read here divine providence 220 it's not in the there the union of the temporal and eternal matters in us is the lord's divine providence this will be eluded this, this will elude even the first grasp of discernment though, unless it is broken down into a sequence and explained clearly step by step. So, the union of what is temporal with what is eternal. That happening inside us is the Lord's divine providence and 
even if we try to, we're, it's going to elude us. How does this work? How does this happen? It's going to elude us. So Swedenborg breaks it down. If you want to go and have a closer look at 220, he breaks it down. But he goes on to say, the following is a necessary sequence. A, it is by divine providence that we divest, empty, divest ourselves of what is physical and time bound by dying. Wow. He then goes and say, and that we put on what is spiritual and eternal. Through his divine providence, the Lord unites himself to what is physical through what is spiritual and to what is time bound through what is eternal. And he does this according to acts of service. Wow. Acts of service. Every time we serve each other in love, not out of ego motivated, but truly out of love, something of eternity is busting through into the now and invading our reality. Incredible, isn't it? Incredible thought. Something of the ego has gone quiet when we're loving and serving someone else and eternity is busting through. I'm going to jump a number of paragraphs here. He says... Just before you... Oh, yeah. What you just said... Yes. ...is the face of God. Is the face of God. It is the divine human. What is it? Is your, is your word... When it busts... Ian, you have... You get, yeah. When it busts... Through, it's, yes. ...and manifests through non-propial service... Yes. ...is the face of God. The face of God. Wow. It's the divine yeah. Wow. So in a sense, we do get to see the face of God we and do. live. Well, actually, no. Sorry, I correct myself. We do get to see the face of God because we've died. We've died to self. No man can see God and live. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> so this day two is not an insignificant event. Something of death is occurring in us. It's the first seeds of death of self. And it is more intellectual, but it's still nonetheless real death. Day six, the, the will dies. And day seven, you come fully into celestial states. Beautiful stuff. But here we're, we're working with day three. Something really amazing happens because we've experienced this separating process from the ego. He goes on to say here down in subsection four, through his divine providence, the Lord is uniting himself to what is physical through what is spiritual and to what is time-bound through what is eternal, and he's doing so according to acts of service. The physical and time-bound are things that we are talking about. The physical and time-bound things that we're talking about are not just those that are proper to the physical world, but those that are proper to us in this physical world. And I'm going to jump ahead and I'm going to explain that. Time-bound things that are proper to us in this physical world are, broadly speaking, matters of eminence, matters of wealth, uh, more specifically, the basic necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter. So what he's saying is, is that, spiritually speaking, a scientist can look at matter and describe it, and that's time-bound and earth-bound, space-bound, right? matter. But Swedenborg is saying, go a little deeper here and say, what is time-bound inside of you? What, what, what's at work inside you because you're caught up in the world of time and space? Well, I want to be eminent. I want to be wealthy. I want to be important. I definitely need food and I need clothing. And you're an idiot if you don't take care of these things. There's nothing wrong with taking care of these things. But at the same time, we, we want to transcend that, don't we? In Christ, we want to be in the world, but somehow not of it. And that's part of day three work here. Day two, we're separating from the ego. Day three, we're going to re-engage with what is temporal, but it's going to actually be a spiritual moment for us, if things are working properly, an eternal moment. So that's kind of what I wanted to push before we dive into day three stuff. He goes on to say the time-bound things that are proper to us in this physical world are wealth, eminence, the basic necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter. These two we also shed when we leave behind at death. And this is fascinating. He said, but we put on and receive things that are similar in their outward guise and appearance, but not in their inward guise. So heaven's still going to have food, clothing, friendship, all the things that we know but internally, we're not going to be driven by this fear of death, 
this need to control, the egocentric stuff, we're going to be released of all of that. Because our eyes will be open to see how the divine is providing everything for us. This may show, you go, the, sorry, they all get their inward guise and essence from acts of service rendered in temporal matters in this world. Wow. Ian, that face of God thing you're talking about? Every time we do an act of service or love towards each other, and it's genuine and the ego is devoid, not only are we, is, is eternity merging with the temporal, but a seed is being sown for eternal life. A seed of how our life's going to be in the afterlife is being sown at that point in time. Because he says it's these acts of service in temporal matter of this world that give the life we live in the next in, in the resurrection. It gives them their external appearance being the same, but inwardly they're now they're now being driven by love. Pure love. And then he goes on to say, this may serve to show that through the Lord's divine providence, the Lord is uniting spiritually and eternal things and physical and time-bound things and doing so according to Acts. Now somewhere else he says, this is exactly why angels, I'll read on, exactly why angels had to be humans first. Hmm. Fascinating, isn't it? Because it's this external world that holds together our experiences. I'll see if he says it here. The Lord unites himself in acts of service by means of their correspondence. Now, we all know what the word correspondence means. It's a very special word that Swedenborg uses to mean that, um, you know, if I say, Sean, I'm so glad you're here. I love you. Right? That act of grabbing his hand, sorry, if I did something socially <laughs> anti distance. I've got to remember that that act was, was an external correspondence of my genuine love to see you. But I could walk up to a complete stranger and fake that. That's called representation, but it's not correspondence. There's no corresponding power in it. But Swinwell talks about correspondences because Moses did the miracles in, in Egypt through the power of correspondences. Fascinating stuff. So when he threw his rod down and turned to a snake, something very deep is going on there that we can't fully understand unless we get into the spiritual sense. Water turning to blood, all these things are very powerful correspondences of things going on inside us, spiritually speaking. But he goes on to say, the Lord does it through acts of service, through means of, of correspondences, and these means that he does so are means of appearances, the external world. They depend on the extent to which we take them as a fact. Since thought cannot help but seem obscure to people who have no clear vision or notion of what correspondences is and what appearances are, I'll illustrate by a number of different things. Somewhere in here he says, angels had to be born physically. And so too we live in this world physically because it contains, it gives a vessel or container for something much deeper that we will go into in the resurrection. Let's leave it there. It's enough to say, we're about to get into day three, and it's enough to say, day three is all about this process of the eternal now beginning to invade the temporal. So you could almost say, day three is chop wood, carry water, all over again. But something has changed inside us, and as I chop that wood, I am in ecstasy. Yeah, as I carry that water, I am in bliss. Because I'm not doing something temporal anymore. It's been elevated through the other two days, the other processes I've gone through, light breaking in and separation of the ego. I'm now able to engage in this in a different way. Okay, so what else do I need to... I think we'll just go into it. And if anything else needs to come out, it'll come out as we... Well, as you're we... on that subject of chopping wood, Darren. Yeah. I, I think of... Um, I think it's Ben Jusen in Uses. Yes. It illustrates the point that... We go, he doesn't use that specific example, but to turn it around to that, he makes a point that when we're chopping that wood, we learn all about our shortcomings as a wood chopper. And we strive to be the best wood chopper we can for the benefit of all. And that's how we go forward through. Beautiful. That. So that wood chopping is not, as it sounds, an onerous exercise that we've got to push through. Yeah. We've got to enjoy it. We've got to do everything we can to be as good as we can at it to benefit the whole of society. And that's how we move forward, by making that wood chopping useful for everybody, not just something we have to wow. get to the next 
stage. How beautiful is that? So it's just worth thinking about. Well, if I could build on that a little bit, you could be chopping your wood and having a day three experience, and then suddenly you're thrust back into a day one experience. You know, you forget yourself, and you start thinking about some passage you were reading the night before, and you're having this amazing enlightenment moment. So the wood chop, we use the wood chopping. Wood chopping is still going to be wood chopping, whether it's day one, day five, day seven. But something has changed on the inside, and that's what we're really focusing on is this change. And they are very cyclic, aren't they, Darren? They're very cyclic. We can be one minute in day, day one, and the next minute we're in hell, day six. Having a spiritual battle, being confronted with something really selfish and evil and terrible, um, you know, that, that's coming up inside you. It can jump around like that. And then, next moment, you're in bliss, and you're resting, and you're chopping, but you're in the zone. When you say that seeing the face of God in acts of service, I recently uh, witnessed someone close to my close in my life that is probably the most selfish person you'll ever meet. And when he was telling me he saw someone that started swearing and they were going off and everyone looked at this man and ignored him. And this person, very close to me, went up to them and said, put his arm around him and said, are you right, mate? And he's F, 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 and he pulled out a card, I have Tourette's syndrome. <gasps> and everyone around him, you're crazy going up to him. You're crazy. And he said, well, he needed help. I don't care who he was. He could be drunk. He could be, he's a drug addict, the way he was acting. And it was my dad and was really surprised. And my dad, this look on his face when he was telling me about this poor guy, and I put my arm around him, and I just saw something in him, and when you were saying that, the look on his face, he was overcome with emotion that people weren't going to help this poor man. Wow, and he was stuck in a loop, a Tourette's loop. Yeah, yeah, and wow. everyone was like, you're crazy going up, he needed help. And he goes, he, he came across as violent, he's a druggie, and all these people, and, he, and, and my dad couldn't believe what people were saying about this. This is a really good example, just so beautiful. They're a really good example of what you're saying too in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Steve talks about his own little encounter with that moment. He's on a train and this father is sitting there and these kids are climbing all over the train and disrupting everybody. Yeah. And eventually somebody walks up and says, could you do something about your kids? And he sort of comes out of his moment and says, oh, I'm so sorry. He said, I I I'm sorry. Come on, kids. He said, we've just come from the hospital where they've lost their mother. Mm. And it changed everybody's attitude in that train carriage around this man and what he was going through. One minute they were tearing him up with the, with the great judgment, uh, you know, um, hammer thing, you know, with the, the judges, <coughs> guilty, guilty, and the next minute suddenly everything changed because of that new perspective, isn't it? Which does point out how important day one work is. That new light, that new perspective that bursts into our consciousness and changes us. Thank you so much. Any other jump in there, I don't mind. I suppose the big thing is that that's really out of character for uh -huh. Chris's dad. He's not like that at all. Like, that is actually a very shocking story that he would be that compassionate because you don't view, yeah, he's probably not viewed that way. So, for both, yeah, the Everything around that. It was a spiritual moment. Story. Eternity was busting through into, into, into temporal. Mm. And everything we do in Christ is out of character, by the way. <laughs> it's out of character with our fallen self. But it's in character with, with heaven, isn't it? And it's beautiful, isn't it? Inspiring. It's given me so much hope. And I, I sort of look at my dad a little bit different now. Cause wow. It was just, wow, he, he is caring. He's never showed a caring side ever. It's just that's weak, you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, the world tells you you're, you're weak. But well, when he was actually telling me that the, the emotion in his eyes, I, guess I just felt for him so much and everyone just... And it, it's, it was a highlight. It's been a highlight. So when you were mentioning it, I thought, wow, this is exactly what I could It was a high light. Mm, mm. That was beautiful. Yeah, go on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, remember where I got it from? If you remember the musical Les Miserables? Yes. It was written by Victor Hugo, who was a reader of Swedenborg. I didn't realise that. I didn't realise that. But in one of the songs towards the end, it says, Truly 
love another is to see the face of God. Mm. It's, a, it's a magnificent musical, that is, but that song which comes very near the end. Beautiful. To truly love another is to see the face of God. Like when you, when you looked at your father, you look at him differently now. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That's amazing. Wonderful stuff. Any, anyone else? This is all good. Don't want to stop you in your track. Let's move into the text. Day 3, Genesis 1, 9, 13. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. So that chaotic water of the ego, the emotions, feelings and thoughts that get churned up by the ego are now being ordered. So they're not completely silent, but they're no longer drowning you. They're ordered into one place. Let the dry land now appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas God saw that it was good and God said let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind and whose seed in itself is upon the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the third day and thus is the, the birth of the church. Earth there in sacred text is the Lord's people here in the physical world. Earth. As opposed to heaven, which is the Lord's people in the afterlife. So we could move around, have some readings. Do you want to read the first little bit, the first paragraph there for us? Sure. New Earth. Now that we have arrived at the third stages of spiritual de development, we need to understand the different ways this day unfolds its work. Firstly, it is the time of resting or returning to what might seem like normal ac activities. Outwardly, but inward, the Paris two days are unfolding new spiritual status within. We are regaining, re-engaging, re-engaging with life and everyday activities. But now we can benefit from the newness of light and the emotional liberation from the period of ego center. This engagement, the right. new birth. Right. So that's the new earth. The new earth is this experience of going about the usual, but the first two days spiritual work is now invading that third day. It's now affecting. And, and this is so important because I was, Russell and I were talking about this last month, and I'll bring it next month. I'll bring a reading from the writings next month about, you know, in Swedenborg's day, 250 years ago, he talks about how very few people were doing day one stuff. There was very few people, almost no one was having day two experiences, and he goes on to talk about how there was no one getting to, almost no one at all getting to day seven. I mean, it's okay because, it, you know, we've been going through the dark ages, in a sense. And of course, uh, you know, like your dad, any time an act of service was done, whether they were getting to these other stages or not, that was a seed. 
and that's all the Lord needs to bring eternal life. But you can see why it's been important. The Lord warned us right from the beginning, I will come again. And when I come again, I'm, I'm going to bring the comfort of this, this light and this understanding, this power, the Spirit of God, so that you can restore, and I'm adding to the Lord's words here, I'm, I'm expanding, not adding, you can restore what is going to be lost. The church was going to lose a lot of this from its early days. But it's, it's, it's just fascinating. Thank you for reading that. And reading it slow, I should probably slow down my reading. I think it would make so much more go in. Um, the, the idea is that when we go beyond simply hearing into doing, these processes begin to invade. Do, any other thoughts on that? No? Dr. Noel, do you want to read the next passage for us? Light coming from the continuing process of day one work will now solidify the development of a spiritual conscience or new heavenly convictions. Added to these convictions are the non-judgmental observations from day two spiritual work. These processes dynamically combine into a sensitive and highly active inner voice. The arising of the new conscience is what Genesis 1-9 calls the dry land appearing. It gives us something solid to stand upon and helps lift us up out of the turbulent waters below. So is that clear? Does that sort of make sense? What's happening there? When you've got a conviction to stand on, you're standing on new earth. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now the fascinating thing is that Swinburne himself doesn't actually use this word conviction in the Akana. He doesn't. And I was talking to Ian about this, we were going over it, and I'm saying, Ian, for me, day three is really the beginning of convictions. Does, does that gel with you? Like, I want to be sure that I'm not giving us a bum steer here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working with the best of my understanding here. And Ian sort of looked at it, thought it, and said, you know, that, that definitely sounds right. Well, only recently was I rereading it again, and I put it, in the, put it in the most recent picture post that I sent out in the email. Clearly, Swedenborg says in day three, this is the moment where real repentance occurs. And I went, Yes, of course. That's what I'm talking about here with conviction, conscience. There can be no repentance if there hasn't been conscience, if you haven't been awakened. And in fact, day two is really giving us this ability to go, ah, uh, that's ego-driven? I've been ego-driven here? That's what non-ego-driven looks like. I really need to repent of being ego-driven. <laughs> And so this is, you know, this can't happen though until you've passed through day two. So day three is the first period where you actually can stand. Real convictions are arising in you and you've got something solid to stand on. And it's the foundation of everything else that's going to come, is that. So do you want to read the next bit for us? Um, we can have respite from the ongoing assaults of thoughts and feelings attempting to flood into our conscious mental process. process. The habits that we have started during an enlightening moment of day one can now become much easier and even automatic, just like the dry land. These practices or habits are supporting us and allowing us a resting place outside of the waters of our deeper thoughts and feelings. Nice. Have we all experienced that at some point where our, our, our thoughts and feelings won't leave us alone? They're harassing us, and then for some reason or other, they do, they seem to stop and go quiet, and we can move on. I that, have to use techniques. You have to use techniques? <laughs> that, that, well, tell us, because these are day three. This is the work of day three, the techniques. Tell, tell us, Ian, what? Well, I might uh, recall a familiar hymn. Nice. Sing that over in my head. Right. Or I might recall a piece of... Uh, a passage from scripture. Beautiful. Wow. Or I might simply get up and go and change where I've been sitting or, or do something different. Quite consciously choose to do it. I'm doing something similar but not as beautiful. I'm just going, help, help, Lord. Come on, but it's the same, it's the same thing. You're turning to sacred text. The Lord is the sacred text. Or a hymn or something like that. But I'm, I'm, I'm off to going, help, Lord. And sure enough, within very swift time, you hear the thoughts and feelings settle. 
They do. Uh, what are other people doing? What, what, what are others doing to stop the barrage of thoughts and feelings? Just observing. Back to day two, observing. Yeah, just observing. Beautiful. And, um, it depends what the goal is too, so if I'm trying to go into the silence, which is the now, from moment to moment, um, <clears throat> when I'm observing thoughts coming to mind, it just comes in randomly, all sorts of thoughts from the past and thoughts about the future. I just say that to myself, well that's to do with the past, not right now. Wow. And uh, so I just wipe it out, but it comes back again, so I just got to keep practicing that to wipe it out and try and come back to the now. But that's not an easy thing to do. Times I can't even do it, they just keep invading me and I sometimes just have to give up and just go with the slow right down. And go but I love the way Russell goes back to day two processes because, you know, think about how Earth forms. Like, we, we see uh, video footage these days of a, a new piece of land appearing. Some volcano goes off underground and poof, suddenly a new big chunk of land just rises up out of the water. That's, that's that internal process going on inside us where we're getting a breakthrough. Just being an observer helps a lot because it, you're separating yourself from those thoughts. Beautiful. I've started using your ploy is the breathing three times. I've started using... I think it's two, but if three's working for you, yeah. go for it. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes we forget, but when we actually do it, it it almost resets things and yet you're... you're it, it, it almost is like you're looking back again and going, oh, wow, I, I, I can't. Another thing is I say the Lord's Prayer whenever I'm feeling... If I can't think of a prayer, I just think of the Lord's Prayer. I say it in my head. Um, I'd say that also helps me to calm down. But also I was reading about this philosopher. He was saying, if we try to force things all the time, it's not natural. So people who are having trouble sleeping, I've got to sleep, I've got to sleep. I try my, that's not natural. The natural process is to go along with it. So I'm trying to go along with things, but when it, the thoughts are out of control, I let it go along, but... Breathe, say the Lord's Prayer, reset, look back, and then you think, you look back and go, what was I feeling like that? <laughs> so recently I had a really, I mean, my, my career status at the moment, and we went to a family gathering on Monday, and they're asking me about my career, and I had a, uh, it was, it's, and I hate those dreaded words, so, uh, what are you doing now with your life? What are you doing? What, how's, how's the job hunting and all this? And I'm like, but then you stop, breathe, say the Lord's Prayer, look back, and I look back now and go, that was a growth, because I'm, I'm, I'm getting scared of uh, social gatherings because that dreaded word, so uh, what are you doing for a job? But and I say to Jane, I'm really scared, but if I sit back, observe it and learn, instead of walking off, we can learn from these experiences then. Wow. Can I, can, can I digress and share a little revelation I had a couple of days ago with you? Is that all right? Yeah, I was looking at a passage, Swedenborg was quoting a passage, I think it was Ian, do you know, was it Zechariah? I am the Lord God that formed the heavens, and I have formed the earth, and I have formed the spirit of man within him. Is it? It's Isaiah, yeah, not the Jeremiah, it's Isaiah. Now Swedenborg translates that, I am the Lord that's created the heavens, and I am the Lord that's created the earth, and I've created the space as well. And I went and looked it up in the Hebrew. And it definitely uses the word Adam, or man, and it uses the word Ruach. So I've created... Ruach is the word breath. So the spirit inside us is called breath in Hebrew. Isn't that fascinating? Breath. It's that I've created the heavens, I've created the earth, and the breath in between. I mean, where did our oxygen come from? It's that space in between. So how do we want to get into day two processes? Breathe. Mm. Or be in the now, as you say, Russell. Just, you know, and, and the technique that, not, not my technique, but I'd heard about this brain hack. You know, have you ever seen a dog go and collapse? Yeah, they do that, don't they? Humans do it too without realizing. So we, it's that second breath. So if you want to do it now, just breathe in and then take another quick second breath and put a little bit more air in there and then just collapse and breathe out. That, order, that, that function of taking that deliberate second breath on top of the first triggers the brain and resets something 
and pulls you right out of all your emotional and physical, uh, physiological processes and just resets stuff. Incredibly, they're amazed at how quick it resets stuff. That's so simple what we forget. So, Jane reminds me, breathe, breathe. So I do sh shallow breaths and, and that, it's not healthy, it's, it, it makes you tense, but when, and when, when you said it to me last week, I'm going to remember that and, and, and it works. So there you go, Isaiah says, I the Lord have created the heavens, your inner man, the earth, your outer man, and the breath in between. <sighs> wow. Day two stuff. Go back to day, if you get stuck at day three, go back to day two See, and I start observing. Just acknowledging this is the enemy, spe you know, speaking into these thoughts, like all that negative stuff. So yes. Even just that acknowledgement. Yes. Is a tool. Yeah. Is that separation. It's a tool. Yeah. Powerful. I think it's fascinating because what you're saying is exactly the same as what Russell's saying, but different perspectives, right? It's the enemy. And then you go, well, what does the enemy use? It uses time, space, person, place, appearances. It appeared like this man was being careless with his kids on the train. No, he was devastated and we couldn't see what was really going inside. So the enemy is so good at using the past, aren't they, Russell? Or fretting about the future. And Russell's going, I'm just trying to just be in the now. And my head is invading me with what went on last week and what's going to happen next week. And it's the same stuff, isn't it? It's the enemy. It's the enemy. So these are some good tools. We've got being in the now observing what is what is is just thoughts and feelings recognizing it's coming from a, a, a not a positive source quoting a psalm or a hymn to or, or even physically reshifting yourself into a different position or cry out for help whatever works for you these are some of the tools that are going to get us there do you want to um, read another one for us and then we'll get jane to read one jesus said get behind me satan get behind me satan beautiful wow no that's powerful we can develop lifelong practices that can be built upon. Although day two work lifts us up above the waters below so that we are free of their adverse influences, we cannot stay there indefinitely, nor can, we, can they give us a place to build and receive the waters above. Thus, day three work is offered to us by the Lord as a means of continued growth. So if you go to somewhere like India and, and Hinduism and that, they, they talk about in the ages past how the great yogis would practice nowism, if I can put it that way. They practice all sorts of transcendental meditation, but they lived a lot longer. Even in their own text, it goes on to say that, that we are living in what's called the Kali, Kali Yuga or the age of deprivation, great demonic forces that work on the earth, and people can't dedicate great hours anymore to meditating. And so that the Lord, in their understanding, the Lord has in, introduced a new method called bhakti yoga, which means the yoga of devotion. So you just, whatever you do, do it under God. Wow, how simple. But this is day three stuff. This is all about learning to get on with life, you know, you spend some time first thing in the morning getting in the now, shutting down the ego's voice, and that sets you up for a really good day usually, doesn't it, Russell? Yeah. And you get on with the day, and the process, whatever you do, dedicate it under the Lord. Do it as an act of service. Spiritualize it. Bring eternity into now. It's not mundane anymore. It's not just uh, natural. It's spiritual by bringing love into it. What an amazing thought. If only we could just do this, get up every day and say, I'm going to fill this day with love, and spiritualize it and make it eternal. Great. Okay, you want to read one for us, Jane? Yeah, before that, the dwelling, got, on the dwelling on the breath, this is uh, in Eastern mystics, the breath is the fundamental factor of uh, consciousness. Mm. So when we are born, we expect the child to breathe out. So when oxygen comes out from the baby, we say the baby is alive. Mm -hmm. When we die, the breath, breath goes in and doesn't come out, hmm. stops. So we call death as taking the breath inside and the life giving the breath outside. So in between the two, the holding of the breath. So all the meditation as uh, Chris was telling, when we breathe in, we should really thank God that, yes, we are going to get into a silence mode and get connected to the divine. 
So hold on your breath for a few seconds. Count one, two, three, four, up to 100. See how your, your lung expands. Mm. And in holding the breath, you'll find the lung is filled with the full of air. And it gets purified and sends the uh, purified blood to the heart. Mm. So there's a cleansing process when you hold the breath. And then you release it, you'll find that you've done this tremendous exercise mm. to your life. So the whole life process is breathing in and breathing out and holding the breath. So this is what is uh, an ultimate uh, exercise for a spiritual development. Wow! And whoever practices this, that's why what he was telling the yogis, they live long because they hold the breath for long. You try one minute of holding breath, so difficult. But they hold it for, min uh, for hours together. Some of the yogis, they don't even breathe out, but they are alive in Himalayan mountains. Dr. Noel, can I, yes. this is beautiful, wow. Can I, can I give a, a perspective from a Swedenborgian point of view too? Okay. Swedenborg talks about the most ancients actually, first of all he says, heaven has an atmosphere, its own oxygen that the spirit breathes. Earth has an atmosphere that the, the physical breathes. Mm -hmm. The most, most ancient people had a practice where they were breathing heaven's atmosphere. And they would breathe it, and they, sometimes they didn't even need to breathe physical air. Just like what you're talking about. Oh, amazing, yeah. So possibly these yogis that are holding their breath are somehow or another tapping into you know, atmosphere of heaven and breathe, and that's sustaining them. Yeah. But it, the reason I even mention this is because, again, we want to look at it from a spiritual perspective, which is... I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So if I'm having a, a, an ego death, I've got to stop breathing the air of the ego, and I've got to start learning to breathe in the air or the atmosphere of heaven, which is an atmosphere of love. Devils get into the atmosphere of heaven, and God doesn't send them out. They flee. They flee heaven because they breathe in that love. Ah, they can't stand and they flee away from heaven. Its atmosphere is contaminated for them because it's full of love. Amazing, thank you. That's amazing thoughts. Um, sorry, do you, Jane, do you want to read the... How are we doing for time? <coughs> we, we may get there. We may get. As we progress into day three work, our ability to separate or step back from the waters below, egocentric processes, must continue. Stepping back from the lower ego won't always be easy because of past habits and our tendency to slip back into autopilot. However, if we pause long enough to realise we are under the lower ego's influence, the way forward is certain and now familiar. The ability to disengage, if even only in a small way, will aid us greatly as we advance into the more subtle work of the remaining days. And it is going to get very subtle as we move on. It really will. Uh, the, the, in fact, I would say that these three days make a whole. They're a spiritual process in itself. We just did these three days, that's regeneration. But what happens is day four comes in and we get higher guidance to move us into newer processes of one, two, three. And then day five, we see a massive expansion as a result of that. And ultimately, day six, we battle some of the deeper stuff inside us. And day seven, we learn to rest in that permanently. So you could say day one, two, and three are a whole process in themselves. If we could just get this stuff right, we, we will make incredible advancement just getting these, this, this stuff of bringing acts of loving service into what we're doing because the ego has become quiet and, and now heaven can flow in or it can rain in maybe, rain in or dew, come down like a dew, whatever analogy works for you. Go on Jane, read another one for us. <clears throat> the second aspect to day three work is the receiving of the waters above. Dry land allows for both seeds to be planted and rain from above to be gathered. With the ongoing outpouring of rain, dry land allows for the de development of underground springs that can break forth from the tops of the mountains, places of worship and gratitude where divine, en divine encounters occur. Mountains offer us higher perspectives on life. Ascent up these mountains also afford even greater clarity coming from the newly appearing conscience. Is that clear? Does, do we want to explore that? Does that make sense? So dry earth now gives us mountains, 
special high places that we high, high moments high lights as you were saying chris high lights go and read some more jane you're doing such a good job there <laughs> The higher we go into spiritual and celestial planes, the more the conscience will develop and transform. On the most external level concerning the world around us, the first evidence of conscience forming is described in Genesis 1 by the grass and herb yielding seed. The same dry land of day three work can now offer us trees and fruit. Children love to climb trees and build cubby houses from where they can look out upon the world beyond their yard. These trees and their fruit are the wisdom of the spiritual realm based upon scriptural insights or what we might refer to as spiritual revelation. The same insight once lifted into the celestial realms will transform even further into something new with higher quality. So what I'm talking about there is the stuff of day three is going to transform later on in day five, six, and into, into day seven. The stuff of day three. I want you to think about this. What are we working with on day one? What, what's the material that we're working with on day one? Light. Light, yeah. What happens, what, what happens to its correspondence now on day three? What's the, what's the correspondence that we now use instead of light? The word of God is coming to us in what form? Rain. Rain, yep. Rain, beautiful. Another one? Seeds. Light has become seed. So, you know, the light coming from day one can stimulate you and bring you into day two. The light now in day three is turned into seed which can produce all kinds of fruits and fruit trees and herbs and stuff. Isn't that amazing? Mm. Aren't correspondences amazing? Mm. This is why you know, the Bible has told us all along the Word of God is all around us, but we're blind. We can't see its language. We've lost the language of correspondence all around us. So here, these seeds, Jesus said, the, the sower goes out to sow a seed. And the disciples, what are you talking about? The seed is the Word of God, which goes into your heart. But if you're stuck in day one, and the Lord throws seeds, where do the seeds go? Well, think about the correspondence. Ian. What, what, what is there? Chaos, deep, deep waters. So what happens to the seeds? They get lost in our deep subconscious mind. How many times have we heard a truth and gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three years later, smack. Wow, what happened there? So the Lord plants these seeds and they may go deep into our subconscious. Sometimes they get brought up with the new earth. They get pulled up as some bit of new earth gets up and finally they can take fruit. Isn't that encouraging? Mm. You know, Jesus said, four kinds of seed go out. One fell on good soil. The other was eaten by Satan, fell among thorns or fell among rocks. Jesus is telling us only 25% of what we're going to hear will actually produce any fruit in us. The other 75% is lost. That's encouraging. You know, that, that's encouraging because I think of how many times I've failed in spiritual processes, but that's okay. All right, let's move on. Uh, would you like to read okay, for us, Haley? Yeah, yeah, go, go. Just, um, I, I think this is beautiful, this, I love all this, but it's not easy because you've got to use your imagination. <laughs> yeah. I would love to see it all in picture. Yes, yeah, so would I. <laughs> You keep harassing me and I'll try and put some of this into... I've been thinking about creating some little cartoons. I don't know, anybody here kind of like cartoons? They're okay, you know? Imagine if some of these principles... Why I like is because you can have a bubble or a square and a whole concept can be in there and then another concept and another concept and another concept. I'd, I'd like to... I've been thinking about this, Russell, how good it would be to try and map these days out a little bit. I've even been picturing like a map and the same map and then it says, you know, I put it before this and it says, cross, you are here, day one. And then dot, 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 the same map. And then I go dot, 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 dot over here. And a little cross, day two, you are here. And sort of map out for people. Of course, New Jerusalem would be the beautiful day seven. You, you make it to New Jerusalem. But I've been thinking about well, what would these other things on the map look like? Yeah, we'll see it clearly. To see it clearly. <laughs> 
James doesn't visualise things. Yes. Whereas I'm too visual. Everything you say, I'm seeing. The seeds grow, I see the rain, I see everything. Sorry, James, I do that to you. you telling me a story, say, um, oh, I went down the road and bought some bread. I imagine them walking down the street, the cars driving down the street, what brand bread, what colour the bread is, what they're wearing, everything I see. Jane can't do that. Right. So sometimes when I'm trying to tell a story, she forgets. Whereas she tells me a story, I remember because I visualise it. Isn't it funny how we're all different like that? But I think that's how we complement each other. Well, in neurolinguistic programming, which is basically just positive psychology, or just <laughs> studying people and see why some things work for some people and why it doesn't for others, they've broken down that our thinking comes in three forms. We're auditory, we're visual, so we think in pictures, I'd say you're visual. Auditory, you know, that means you, you, you hear the voice of God sometimes? Auditory. You're auditory, so you, sometimes you'd hear God's voice. More than he'd drop a picture in your head. God would speak to Chris by dropping a picture in his head, or angels. I'd say angels would drop a picture into your head and angels would talk to you. Well then there's kinesthetic. Ever walked into a room and gone, this doesn't feel right? You're kinesthetic. But I want to challenge you here because Christ is in you and you are all these things. But what neurolinguistic programming teaches us is that we will be primary in one and we'll be secondary in another and tertiary in another. So we'll tend to think visually and then our thinking will then go into feeling or thought, uh, uh, feeling or words, uh, sounds. But you can train yourself to awaken those other areas of your life. And it's just because it will help. It'll bring you into more fullness. So look, whatever it is, so I apologise that I'm such a visual person myself. Um, I, mean, I think I'm more like auditory. The, I like the idea of, yeah, like having the, you know, the pictures to look at. Yeah. I think I'm more auditory, but I, I, I'm my visual secondary, but I don't know. I can never figure it out. I, I, sometimes I walk into a situation, I feel things so strongly, but I, I think we can work on all of these. Whatever your, your style is, being aware of it is helpful. And they did say, because they... Yeah, with teaching and that sort of thing, they're talking about, oh, children have a primary and then they've got, they've moved away from that. So have they? We right. We each have a little bit of all of it. Right. So we need to, yeah, people need to be thinking about those three realms. Well, Ian would say the cause would be the loves, what's driving them. You know, that your love is driving you and causing those things to come alive and get used more than the other things. So at the end of the day, we, we, we are our loves. That's what we really are. What do you think, Darren? Um, I'm actually wondering about where the olfactory sense comes into that because it's mm. a very strong trigger. Yeah. I, I would put it next to kinesthetic. I'd say that the smelling and feeling are, the, are very much the same. I mean, you smell something beautiful and you're like, oh, you smell something foul. And <laughs> But it's linked to memory. The olfactory is very much linked to memory. It's not necessarily linked to learning. Yeah, like, I think people have a preferred learning mode for new things, but yeah, olfactory is very much linked to past. So some people might smell, like Chris might smell a flower and suddenly picture whole fields of beautiful gardens and things. <laughs> Tulips. And tulips don't have a smell, but I've seen tulips. I've seen tulips. And gerberas. They don't have a smell, but I can see them. Mm. Yeah, but the mystics say every, there are most of a trillion cells in our body. Right. Every cell has a memory. Wow. Every cell. It is not only that we think the brain has got the memory. No, every cell. Wow. You see, when we die, all these cells have a recorded memory which cannot be just erased. It mm. reminds. And it continues. So death is not your death because of this memory, which is registered in a different platform, yeah. not the brain. Brain loses its memory only when we die, but the cells don't lose the memory. So this, and the more we explore these spiritual dimensions, we find that unless we get everything integrated together, the body, mind, and soul integrated together, the experience of spirituality will be always weak. So we need to bring these three components together. To Beautiful. Release, no? Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Go on, Hattie. Do you read, read, read a bit more for us? Maybe on the second last paragraph. I think we're on the second last. Does that mean Glenn misses out or should we make Glenn read the last paragraph? Is Glenn a reader? Do you mind reading? Or? <laughs> I can read it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he went to school. <laughs> 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 this 
stage of development, we need to climb and explore the branches of spiritual consciousness if we wish to taste of their fruits. If we make the effort to climb, the same maturing conscience will, by day five, take flight and reach even higher levels. And by day six, the conscience will have obtained the celestial quality of perception, which does not require searching or exploration. Instead, the insights belonging to perception manifest immediately <clears throat> with the light and heat that is self-evident to the mind and heart of the advancing soul. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Jesus says, uh, what do you say? I, I I can of myself do nothing. <coughs> I hear and I judge, and my judgment is correct because I seek not my own self. Or something, something to the last word, yeah, seek not. The point is the Lord, his whole internal processes were so integrated. You know, Swedenborg says his soul was Jehovah. Not another. He was Jehovah in human form. But when he hears, what he hears is correct. What an amazing process here. We, we're now at the point where we've got to do a bit of searching. We've got to climb the tree of our conscience. We've got to explore its branches. We've got to get to feel safe and dig around like the child and say, why is this right? Why is that wrong? How come, you know, God created one man for one woman? And what's wrong with this or right with that? And we've got to explore this and climb it like the child. But when we get to day five, we can take flight. The birds come. And the birds need somewhere to rest, and it's those conscience trees that we've formed. Well, by day six and seven, angels look at something and just know that's right or that's wrong. They don't need to think about whether it's right or wrong. You know, if I told you to think about a nook-a-nook, and -nook, you know, that probably is a real word in some language, <coughs> some party immediately goes, nah, that's a made-up word. You didn't even have to think about what a nook-a-nook -nook was. I have no, no idea what a nook-a-nook -nook is. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, like, angels just know what an amazing state to be in. But now we're at the stage where we've got to develop and climb our conscience. We've got to grow it and climb it. Yes? All right. Uh, w w will we get Hayley to read the last paragraph? Oh, oh John, you, uh, Glenn, you said you were happy to read. I'm happy to expect you to spread You even went to uni, didn't you? Oh, yes. A couple of times. For now, though, day three work requires for us to be sensitive to the new earth we are called to explore. We need to honour and respond to even the slightest of angst flowing forth from the conscience. We must return to the repetition of everyday work and now awakened to a growing spiritual dimension. As we respond to the conscience, we become responsible. We can never be happy doing what is wrong. Although it may pain us and cost up much to do what is right, our senses gradually become filled with new heavenly delights and we start to taste of the heavenly person. The very beginnings of the celestial life starts with the subtlest of receptivity to the natural spiritual conscience and its early awakenings as found in the new earth of day three. Right, so before we move on, we're nearly done, and I don't mind if we go over just a few more minutes. For the sake of what you're saying, Russell, let's just try and explore this one last time. Tease it out a bit, away from all the pictures and analogies, because I, I can see we get lost in the forest sometimes of, of ideas and things. So what are we getting from day three? What, what's the most important ingredients that you're getting from that? That you're, you're living your life. Trying to practice what you've learned. Yeah. From, so you've got on with living your life while you're practicing. Yeah. So you're, con you're living your life, but with conscience. With conscience. With a voice that's now managing the way that yeah. you. Oh, lovely. Your life, rather than just doing it sort of like in an automatic, yep. egotistical way. Which we all slip into regularly. So this is going to be, a, as you say, Russell, it's going to be an ongoing process, isn't it? Yeah. Is that helping a little bit as we sort of talk about it more away from the imagery? Oh, yeah. Day it's three is... Helpful, yeah, day three... Say it again. Day three is, is endeavouring to live the new thoughts we're having, separated from the ego, and being conscience-driven. Nice stuff. Good. Any, Ian, do you want to say something? No? Is that enough? It's, um, it's disengaging. Third dip, uh, consent is a re-engaging. 
disengaging from the normal activities and re-engaging with the spiritual world. So the egos are out of uh, the focus. So that's what the third day really means. I, I would lean more to day two being that. Day two is we're disengaging from, you know, we're taking some time to actually just have a cup of coffee or whatever your spiritual practice is and disengage and really get out of the ego. But day three is more about going back into your day but taking that consciousness and conscience with you. Don't slip back into autopilot. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that we're spiritualizing what is natural. I mean, re can you see the difference between an, a spirit, an eternal act and a natural act? You, you can't, unless you, unless you have spiritual senses going, wow, that was a, a grace-filled love moment I just saw there. Wow. Or like you say, your dad, you know, that, that knocked you. Mm -hmm. Your dad going up and hugging that man. Actually, it's such a good point. Until we see love in action, it's really hard, isn't it, to spiritualize concepts like that. Love in action. Does that help? So it's a re-engaging. Going back into the usual, but don't get caught, don't go back into sleep. If you've taken the red pill, there's no going back to sleep in the matrix. You, you can go in there, but you know exactly what you're in. You're in the matrix, but you're not of it. Yes, good, good, good. Anything else? Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah? I was just going to say, going back into the everyday things, Yep. Um, just trying to be consciously aware of um, your whole mind in action throughout the day. It's not an easy thing to do, but that's, I guess, the idea of just consciously watching your thoughts, feelings, emotions and what you're going through throughout your day. When, in that divine state. Of <coughs> when we get to day seven and we've actually died to <laughs> self, it is so ridiculously easy that it's called a rest. It's called a rest because all you're doing is just being in love and there's no struggle no fight you haven't got to try and control the thoughts or this or that it's all you're just in love but that's a very elevated state to to, to get to Russell it really is a we I think we touch it at different times in the day mm. don't we or in the week or you know or, or maybe in the year for some <laughs> it could be Easter or Christmas uh, Christmas is a good time you know the music starts up and the bells and the dressing you can feel it it's very easy to slip into charity isn't it mm -hmm. it is yeah one, okay. One thing that comes up, if this is a, a much more subtle level. Yeah, yes. So, yes. Yeah, things in the past, yeah, the previous things are, yeah, not as, but, yeah, so it, you're really having to focus or, yeah, so it's much more. You really want to yeah. be aware of the work you're doing. Yeah. Be aware of the work you're doing, which is, I thought you said it well, Hayley. It's about not slipping out of conscience, keeping your conscience alive. Doing the same things, but, but endeavouring to do it acts of service. That's a simple way of putting it, acts of service and love. But trust me, even in that, oh, the ego gets in and, oh, I'll get brownie points and aren't I so clever? Oh, you go first, you go to first, because I'm more humble and spiritual, so I'll go last. Oh, the ego, the stench. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it gets us. But it is a much more subtle process, it is. But hey, perfect practice makes perfect. So, is this helping? This is some big stuff we're getting into. When we get to day seven, we'll go back to the parables and hopefully we'll look at them within the context of these days. So we'll revisit all this again. But it's, you know, yeah. Any, any thoughts, last thoughts, Darren? No. Guang, do you want to say something? Thank you, no. No? Then let's pray. Shall we, shall we pray? <coughs> Dear Lord, we're so grateful for this opportunity that people are coming together and giving of their precious time to focus in on you, to focus in on each other, to improve themselves and to improve their spiritual practice. So Lord, may, we, may this time that we have spent here, may it be spiritualized and eternalized into, in, in, into moments of breakthrough, into moments of seeing your face, into moments of love. We're, we're now more motivated to love, to love you and to love others because we see how important it is to our spiritual practice. Amen. So now you get to just go off and enjoy day three. Go off and just re-engage with your coffee and your friends and all that and see how much you can bring into it. <laughs> yeah.